Okay, I think I am live. Um, good morning. Today's uh, demo is going to be this little downy woodpecker. Uh, this was a photo that I took a little while ago, and um, I just I love this this fantastic texture on the bark and the softness of the little bird. And uh, so yeah, I thought that that's what I thought I'd share with you today. So before I start, um, let me just um, ask you if you are joining me, where you're from, put a comment in the uh, chat and let me know. And there, there we go. Oh, good morning, Sue. Hi, Patricia. Hi, Karen. Thank you for joining me. I know you, I've seen you guys before. Thank you for being my regulars. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I'm going to be working, as you always, I'm working on Arches 140 pound cold press paper. I pre-stretched it. I, um, I stapled it onto a board and, and so on. And I'm using mostly Da Vinci watercolors, which uh, are actually from the tubes. They, this palette didn't come with them, but as you can see, I've put quite a bit of water in each of the wells. That's so that I can get the paint nice and fluid. And um, I'm going to be using mainly some squirrel hair brushes today. So uh, I really like these because of the fantastic point. Once I get it wet, you can see that it's got like a like a really, really fantastic point on it. Um, and this bigger one too. But what I really like about it is it holds so much and um, gives me control because it actually comes to this nice point. So I'm going to use a, a couple of these for this today. And I'm going to start off with, uh, you know, just sort of talking about my um, my composition here. I have I've changed it to a vertical. I'm going to I'm going to just zoom in on this. I think this. Um, format right here kind of makes the the bark the main focal point but I wanted to focus in more on the bird so I've decided to change it to a vertical format um, I love this this soft out of focus background here and, um, and this super rough texture on the on the bark so we'll, we'll create that um, and now you kind of think of a woodpecker as being black and white right but if you look here this color this this chest area here is quite different from this background so this is a warm color a warm white this is a cool white so we'll need to treat those a little bit differently um, okay so uh, first things first I'm going to begin with some washes and I'm going to start coming in with uh, some of the colors if you look past all this dark stuff in here and look at what what colors are within this light area here um, I think there's actually quite a variety. There's some cool color, there's some warm color, and so on. And um, after a while, you'll train yourself to actually sort of look past those darks, look past the details, and see what colors are actually there. So this side of the, the tree trunk here, now I know I've cropped some of that off, but this side is cool, whereas this side is warm. This side's receiving more light than the right-hand side. So I want to keep that in mind that I want this sort of variety in here. So I'm going to start by uh, wetting this whole thing and just dropping in some, some warms and cools where I think they'll be appropriate. And this is just clean water and I'm putting it on fairly generously because I really want to be able to um, uh, drop in the color and just have it blend softly. I know it's a very rough texture and everything, but um, this under layer is very much a wash. So just clean water and I'm just gonna I'm just kind of scooping it out of my bucket here just to make sure I'm spreading lots on if I tip it up you can see you know I'm putting lots on there you can see places where I've missed 
uh, you know, but lots on there. It's actually kind of running around on the surface. I love the, the amount of water or paint that these brushes hold. So this is a natural hairbrush and synthetic synthetic hairbrushes are really quite good too, but you know, as good as they are, I still think that these natural hairbrushes do hold more. Although they're getting the synthetics are getting better all the time. Okay, this one's actually a blend. It's not pure squirrel hair. It's just a it's a synthetic and squirrel hair blend. Um, the the brand this one's called Danai, I think. D A I N A Y W. However you pronounce that, <laughs> I'm not really sure. All right, so I'm going to maybe just come into. I'm going to try some raw sienna here. I'll put in some some raw sienna, a little bit of uh, permanent rose as well in a minute. And all of these colors will make a difference underneath. So then the tree isn't going to look just gray. It'll have some really nice variations in it. So I'm going to use maybe a little bit of, um, uh, I was going to use permanent rose, but I think I'm going to use rose door, which is a nice warm red. And it, you, you can see it's really diluted. I'm not putting, I don't want to overdo this color. I just want to put a little bit in here. keep my tree from being static and dull. And I'm going to use a little bit of cobalt blue. Now I didn't rinse out my brush really, so um, it's picked up a little bit of that color and made this a little bit duller, which is fine. But basically I've got primary colors here. I've got red, yellow, and blue. Um, Lots of variations in here. I'm going to go easy with some of this because there's a lot of darks that I will come in to put in, but um, there's some nice colors there. And one thing I'm not doing is I'm not stirring together all of these colors. Stirring it together, if I took all these colors here on my palette and mixed them together, they would all turn into one color, right? So now they're all the same, pretty much. And then I wouldn't have this lovely um, color variation in here. So I need to just sort of touch in the color and not spread it around. Uh, let me just... Uh, where is my... Pop out chat here. I'm just trying to... Ah, there we are. Okay. Oh, good morning, Melody. Hi, Debbie. Thanks for joining. Hi, Grace. New York. Awesome. Thank you for spelling that, Sue. Yes, that Sue, what Sue wrote there is the correct spelling for the um, for the brushes. All right. So because I've made that so wet, that's going to take a couple of minutes to actually dry. So I'm going to move on. Well, um, maybe before I move on, I'm just going to take a dryer to this and I'm just going to dry it slightly. But it is so wet right now. Like if I tip this, this paint would actually run. So I'm going to take my brush and just where I see kind of extras, I'm just going to touch it a little bit. Or it could even take the edge of my paper towel and just touch 
not not blotting see I'm holding it way up here and I'm just going to blot now this sorry I reused my paper towel so that's that one's pretty dirty but um, here I'll just use this one and just touching it in I don't want to remove too much color so I don't want to pull off too much here uh, just where I see puddles okay um, all right so what I'm going to do is I will mute myself and I'm going to uh, give this a little bit of a dry before I uh, put in a background. Some of this, I've dried it enough that this is, um, it's still really wet. You can see it's wrinkled. You can still see it's got some shine. But if I tip this, now uh, any of the extra water is just going to collect along the sides here. And I'm just going to wipe it with my paper towel. Alright, so that's just going to um, take up some of that extra moisture. And then I will um, just dry it a little bit. And I should mention that when I'm drying this, I didn't start like an inch away from the um, surface. I'm starting way, way back, maybe 12 inches or so away from my surface so that I get more of an, an overall uh, softer uh, uh, amount of heat so, and air so that um, if you hit it too close, you end up pushing the paint around. <clears throat> so I want to just give it more of an overall light fan as I do this. So I'm just going to mute a little bit longer and uh, get this dry. Okay, so you can see how much softer that has dried. Um, that you know the colors have sort of um, melted together a little bit, and uh, it has dried about twenty percent lighter, at least, maybe even more. Um, good morning, Grace. Uh, yes, uh, Grace. Regarding the staples, uh, Grace is asking. Um, um, do I always staple or tack my paper down to a board? Yes, I do. Uh, but when I staple it down, uh, the paper is wet. So what I do is I soak my paper in room temperature water for about three minutes. And then I put the wet paper onto this board, which I'll explain in a second. And I quickly staple it down. Um, and I put uh, generally, I just, this is just a regular stapler because of the type of board I'm using. But I just quickly go along and then I turn the board and I staple it along here and so on. And I generally will put an, a staple down for every inch. So if this is, uh, you know, if this is 12 inches, there'd be about 12 staples kind of thing. There was, and so on. So I'm pretty generous with my staples because I like my board to dry really nice and flat. So in the next 
in the morning what I do when it, everything's dry and this is nice and tight and, and flat again, I, um, I tape it down. So I actually just taped this down this morning, but it had been stretched before. Now the board that I'm using here, this, this type of board, you can see it looks like foam in the middle, but it's not foam board. And I really want to point out that this, even though it looks a lot like foam board, it is definitely not. This has an actual veneer on the top and on the front and back, whereas foam board only has paper. So um, this is a product called Gator Board. Uh, you will see it sometimes at your art store called Watercolor Board. So uh, take a look at your local art store for either one of those um, products. Good morning, Karen. Oh, Karen, you've, you've already answered about the uh, Gator Board. Excellent. Um, yes, and this, is, this pre stretching is what makes me know that and ensures that this is going to stay totally flat by the time this is dried. Um, good morning, Margot. Hi, Sharon. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I, I like to pre stretch my paper because it stays flatter as I'm working it. Now, it, it will buckle a slight bit when it's wet, but I know that it'll go <clears throat> totally flat again. <clears throat> Pardon me. I need a drink. <clears throat> All right, so um, so now that I have this dry, and it's it's not a hundred percent dry. I don't know if you can see the buckles in it, but I can still run my hand along here, and it's still got a little bit of bumpiness to it. But I know that the paint's not going to move around on me. So uh, let me get rid of this since I mixed it all up and got it all uh, all the same color. Um, so I'm looking at my background here, and um, this is just the camera did this. It's kind of cool. I'm wondering what I could do with this background. I could actually, um, oh, I think I could throw some salt into it. That might be a fun effect. So um, I'm going to mix up a gray. I'm going to use, um, uh, let's use a little cobalt blue and... I'll use some burnt sienna and that gives me a kind of a nice blue gray right cobalt blue burnt sienna actually yeah that's cobalt blue so um, I'm gonna wet this area I'm gonna work around the bird don't have to worry too much about the black areas of the bird but I do have to watch the white areas so um, Again, I'm just going to get this really good and saturated uh, using a brush that holds tons of water because that's what's going to keep um, that's what's going to keep the paint on top so I can place it before it soaks in. So I don't wet the surface first. The paint will grab the paper and stay stuck. But if I wet the paper, I can keep the paint on top and I can actually move it around a little bit and it'll be nice and soft. That's the effect I'm looking for in this background. It's nice and soft. It'll contrast the, the coarse texture of this bark. That's pretty good. I'm leaning to one side to make sure I can see if I've missed any spots. Because you can tell in the light whether you've missed any spots because everywhere you've wet is shiny. All right, so I'm going to take some of this gray and just drop it in. I'm going to mix a little more of it, I think. I don't want to mix it too equally. I want to keep it a little bit more on the blue side so that it stays in the cool family. If I had too much of the um, burnt sienna, it ends up looking a little bit too flat gray, and I want it a little bit more on the cool side. So, okay, so here we go. Lots of great textures here. Now, at the 
back of the bird, the bird's head, you have a couple of spots that are white. I can actually emphasize those by placing some color in those places so that I'll get that nice contrast. And I can do it without it being like super obvious. Uh, but there we go. And then I'm going to take a, a little bit of just ordinary table salt. And I'm going to put this on here, but actually before I do that, I'm going to um, I'm going to maybe take a little bit of the burnt sienna, add it to this, and put just a couple of warms, warm grays in here. So I added a little more burnt sienna, and you can see in my palette that I've got now a cool gray and a warm gray. So I'm going to take a couple of spots and put a little warm gray in. This is that wonderful out of focus, can't tell what it is, but it's interesting kind of thing. So that's what I'm putting in here. All right, so I want a little bit up against the, the tree here. I don't want to totally avoid the tree. All right, so this looks like it might be a little bit dark, but by the time I sprinkle some salt on and this dries, now I know that this isn't a texture that's actually in the photo, but I'm taking a little artistic license here. And this is ordinary table salt. It's nothing special, just regular iodized table salt like you would have in your salt shaker. Okay, um, so that's going to give a little bit of texture to that background. Meanwhile, I'm going to wipe off these edges because whenever you have this sort of um, wet background and you get the puddles of paint or water on your edges. Um, if those, if you tip your board for some reason, let's say you tip it to see if it's dry or something, and the water from the tape, which takes longer to dry, is going to drip down and it's going to uh, create a blossom along your edges. So it's really important to keep your tape wiped. All right. So I can see the salt just beginning to work. Um, what I'll do, I'm going to zoom in on this so you can see. Because whatever, it, what happens when you add salt, oops, wrong way, sorry. Um, what happens when you add salt is uh, it, every granule absorbs the paint from around it and then it starts to like make little designs within your, within your paint. So I find that really interesting. Um, can be really nice, but you can overdo it too. So um, that's something I would caution you about. It's, it's not to go too nuts with this technique. It's nice to use once in a while, uh, but don't use it in every painting and don't use it all over your painting. Um, you know, I've got some spots here that I kind of avoided. You know, I've just sort of randomly placed a few bits. So some areas won't really have much at all, and others will have like a little cluster. So uh, let me zoom out again, and I'm gonna I'm gonna start working on this bark. I'll get to the to the woodpecker very shortly because of course the woodpecker is fun, um, but I do have to wait for this to dry. I can't start painting the woodpecker right up against this background because it's wet. So I'm gonna start coming in and creating a little bit of texture on on this uh, tree bark here. So I'm going to take, this is a smaller uh, squirrel hair brush. Uh, this one is, uh, this is a different brand. This one's um, B-I-A-E-L-K. Baya elk. I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but 
Again, it's, um, it's a squirrel hair brush, and this one's actually a travel brush. It's kind of cool. You um, can pop that in your purse or in your pocket and uh, travel with it. So it's kind of a neat design. And uh, I, have, I have a similar type of thing in my synthetic brushes, but I'm going to use this um, squirrel hair brush for this. Um, Now, um, what I want to do, and maybe I'll use some of the grays that I used in the background here. I'll just mix this together. And I'm going to blot my brush. And I'm going to use the side of it. I'm not using the point. I'm not holding it up here at the, at the, uh, near the bristles. I'm holding it further back. And I'm going to use kind of the side of the brush. And I'm going to create some of these textures here. So. I'm dragging this brush, and that's why I blotted it, so that I would get a little bit of texture as I drag this brush across. And you can see that as long as your brush isn't overloaded, you can get some really cool textures with this. You'll know immediately if your brush has got too much in it, because it'll just kind of fill in. Um, now, one thing I will note, uh, will make a note about though, is if I start putting texture all over this, I'm not going to see any of these lines that I put in for my uh, background. So I think before I get too crazy with this, is I'm going to come in and get some of my real darks in my um, in the bark, and for that I'm just going to use some Payne's Gray. Payne's Gray, if you use it fairly. Um, undiluted, like just a little water, just enough to make it flow, it can be really, really dark. So um, that can be really helpful. So I'm just going to come in here and start creating some of the darks in my texture. I think I accidentally hit my background there, so I'm just going to blot that. Um, all right, so for the cracks, now here's a big hint for, for when you're doing something and you want it to look a little bit more natural, is um, uh, you want to uh, create the cracks so that they don't look like you just took a line and made a wiggly worm. So what I do is I just kind of lift my brush and, and sort of do a, a dotted line, like almost a dotted line. So I get the, this wonderful thick, thin, and my edges aren't that great. So that makes it look so much more natural. So let me zoom in on that so you can see what I'm doing. Um, and uh, I should talk to you. You were saying, Grace, that you want to get a staple remover. Actually, I don't, need, I don't use a staple remover. If you use regular staplers, staples on this board, and that's what I, that's what I like about this board. Sorry, I'm jumping around here, but... Um, I don't want to forget this question. Here's what I use to remove my staples. Just this thing here. And um, it's as easy as, just let me grab something quickly here. Okay, so for removing staples, I just put it under, grab it with my thumb, and it comes out so easy, and I can remove that very, very quick. So that's what I use for my staple remover. I don't have to buy a special one. Anyway, back to, back to the uh, texture in this bark. I'm using Payne's Gray not too diluted. Um, and I'm dabbing on the um, these cracks in the wood so that I have interesting uh, variations in there. And I'm going to follow my my drawing loosely, but I'm not going to be too much of a slave to it because it's bark after all.
I'm going to put a little paint or a little uh, burnt sienna into this just to warm this up in a couple of places. You probably won't see the difference on the camera, but there is a slight difference if I add a little burnt sienna to this. Let me zoom out a little bit. All right. So I'm doing I'm doing the bigger ones first, the bigger cracks and crevices. And I'm painting very much with the side of my brush except for you know when I get into uh, some of the finer cracks and things like that. But um, pretty much I'm laying the brush on its side and I'm manipulating the angle depending on what I'm trying to do. But I'm guilty of um, having <laughs> having painted bark that just looks like a line. They just look like, you know, line, and it does look like somebody painted lines on the bark. So this always looks a lot more natural. And it's just touch, 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 touch. And much more believable, I think. So I'm going really dark on these deep ones. As I get into some of the finer cracks, I'll be changing up the color and uh, doing a few different things. Oh, a big crack right there. And I'm trying to keep keep in mind that I'm painting around that shape, that it's um, I'm not just painting the cracks. I'm painting. I'm I'm leaving the areas behind that are going to make this uh, textured. You probably see some of the salt effect really taking taking hold now. Um, the one thing about the salt is that it will take time though. Uh, it's, it's not something you can rush. You can't blow dry it because the salt is going to have to um, uh, just take its time and absorb what's around it. If you dry what's around it, it won't work. Okay, so kind of kind of lost track of what I'm doing here, but um, I can create the idea, I don't have to be exactly like my picture, I just need to get the idea of the bark. And I want to keep this really dark. One thing that putting this real dark in is going to do to help me um, as well is um, judging the rest of my values. So if I get the darks in early in my painting, uh, then I know that when I paint this part that it's going to be the right value, you know, when I paint the, the rest of the texture on the bark. If I work just light to dark, um, I'm going to get to the dark and I'm find out that a lot of my lights are probably too light. And the reason that happens is because of um, comparative um, value changes, right? So if you only see white, you're going to think what you're putting down is dark. But if you um, if you um, put, have a dark in there, you're going to you're going to know because the, the white of the paper is the lightest thing you have and then this will be the darkest thing. So um, I'll be able to work that out. Um, Whatever textures I do create here, I can um, incorporate into my the pattern of my bark. 
trying not to be too much of a slave to my picture, my photo. Sometimes I do, I, you know, it depends on the, on the subject or how I'm feeling that day. Sometimes I just will make something really high realism. <clears throat> um, and sometimes it depends on the time I have too. Sometimes I have lots of time to work, in which case I can kind of get lost in my details, but um, other times I don't have the luxury of uh, going and taking my time with it, so I have to uh, I have to speed it up in those cases. And I will try not to get overly um, overly involved here because this is a live demo, and I don't want to keep you all day. I appreciate your coming. Um, if you know somebody who might be interested in watching this, by all means, let them know. There's a, I believe, a share button. I'm not sure. <clears throat> I think there is. Uh, and so I'm curious. Um, did most, are most of you here because you saw it on Facebook? My, my share on Facebook or. Do you follow me, um, my page, or let me know. Then I know what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong, right? Okay, so lots of thick, thin. And I love this sort of jagged, jagged uh, stroke that this sort of laying the brush down gives me. Oh, yeah, I, and I hear you, Karen. I, I get lost in my details, too. Um, I'm working on a project for my, for my daughter's wedding, and uh, it was going to be loose, ha, -ha. but uh, it uh, never turns out that way for me, it seems. I kind of just kind of lose myself in that stuff. All right, so... Let's get some of these others up in here. Try not to get my hand in the paint. And the salt effect is, is looking pretty, pretty nice here. It looks kind of a, looks wintry is what the feeling I get out of this, which is fine. Um, downies are a winter bird. They will stay all year. Uh, we see them at our feeder all the time. And they're they're uh, particular about which seeds they like. <laughs> they throw half on the ground, and then they pick and choose the ones they want. It's like a buffet for them, I guess. All right. Okay. So coming in here, um, some of these I'm going to lighten up uh, just slightly, thin it, thin my paint a little bit. Uh, but, and this looks like it's way too contrasty, but I'm going to obviously add a lot more in here, like these textures. But I wanted to get some of these uh, cracks and crevices in here before, um, before I lost all my detail. It's fun how you can do this kind of sloppy. And it looks good. I did draw in. Um, oh, actually, I transferred from the from a printout, but I transferred the drawing. I didn't draw it today, I, just for time's sake. Um, I will try and draw most of the time, but uh, if I don't have a lot of time, I will transfer. I think it is a 
definitely a benefit to you. It'll help your painting if you learn how to draw because it helps your understanding of the subject. If you have to think about it and look closely to draw it, you already have a good understanding by the time you pick up your paintbrush. Um, you've had to examine it. You've, you can basically work out uh, a lot of um, potential um, problems as you're drawing as well. You're, as you're drawing, you're also thinking about your, your painting process. All right, so this is coming pretty good. I'm going to cut a couple of darks in here. And uh, yeah, so now I'm going to take this paint and thin it a little bit. I'm going to add a little more burnt sienna, thin the paint a little bit. And I'll do a few more just with um, finer lines. Got to be careful where I don't stick in my hand here. I'm going to get it in my wet paint. And I'm really using the tiptoe of the brush at this point. Um, I, can, I can go ahead and get some finer lines in here. And so I'm taking those lines, those uh, thicker lines that I did, and I'm kind of dissecting them and breaking them into smaller pieces. I, mean, I am looking at my picture though, uh, just so that I don't get out of um, out of line in terms of the um, the textures and stuff. I want to I want to keep it basically in this vertical format. <clears throat> All right, so I think that's probably enough for now. Um, and uh, we'll get going with the, some of the textures. So let's, let's come back to this nice uh, blue-gray that I had mixed up over here. I'm going to blot my brush and I'm going to continue adding some of these textures. And I'm following this piece of bark is curled. The direction of my strokes is going to be curled. It's darkest on the left, so that's where I start. Blot my brush. And that blot's very important if you want to get the texture right. So I'm going to just come down here and Using the side of my brush, I'm just letting it skip over the texture. The thing about using cold press paper is it has this little bit of a toothy texture to it, and um, it gives you that uh, wonderful uh, bumpiness that when you slide your brush along sideways, it will capture that, sort of catch along the edge of that uh, texture. I will, I will try and get right to my edges as well um, with some of this texture. Just the side. I've got this, this piece here that's hanging out. I love how that sort of skims over that paper, that uh, texture on the paper. 
Ooh, picked up the wrong color there. And this gray is much lighter than the, the crevices that I did, of course. And um, this will not be the final texture I'm putting on it, though I will come in with some definitely some warmer um, tones as well. So this is cobalt blue and burnt sienna. It will definitely skip over the, um, I have the, the Arches logo here, and I actually oriented the paper. I mean, the Arches logo should go in the corner anyway, but um, I deliberately wanted it here because I knew the texture would hide it. Puddle's getting pretty dry, so I'm not bothering with blotting my brush. You can see this isn't isn't really runny paint here anymore. It's just uh, hardly any left. So all right. So I'm getting pretty much have a texture all over now. It's a little bit up in the corner here to do. All right, so let's get some warms in here. I'm going to use some um, burnt sienna, mix it with um, cobalt blue, but this time I want it warmer. So I'm going to put more burnt sienna in it. So it's a little bit on the brown side. Actually, that makes a wonderful brown, if you should ever be needing a brown. All right. I'm going to put, I think I'm going to put a little burnt or raw sienna in here too, because it's a little bit almost greenish, this uh, gray, or this uh, neutral color in here. So now I'm going to start. Um, really being deliberate about where I put some of this and leaving some of those lighter areas to show as the texture. So I'm coming back in uh, and I'm layering in this texture because it will have uh, more dimension when you do more than one layer. So And I'm just continuing with the side of my brush here and I'm thinking more in terms of each sort of section as I'm doing this. The first one I wasn't being that specific but now I'm being a little bit more specific because I need to start thinking about keeping those highlights that I don't want to um, you know just go all here, here and there and everywhere and not be thinking about where those highlights are going to be. Uh, because if I don't think about the highlights, I won't have that, you know, the curving and that sort of thing that happens on some of this bark. Because uh, there's definitely some of it that's sort of curling up away from the tree. And I want to create that effect. So. Some raw sienna, raw sienna and cobalt blue. So my go-to neutrals are pretty much burnt sienna and raw sienna. Um, 
there's things like burnt umber and and all of that but I find that I can pretty much mix those colors so I don't even though I have them on my palette I really don't use them that much because I can just mix them but um, if I mix raw sienna with cobalt blue it turns a little on the greenish side so so some of this actually does have a greenish tint to it actually see it starting to develop this texture is awesome though I just love the the warm and cool within there so I'm just sort of fluctuating between um, the uh, blue and the either raw sienna or burnt sienna um, Oh. Hi, Anne. Um, I'm just reading through the comments here. I'm back to teaching soon and we'll be able to watch the recordings. Oh, okay, Karen. Um, good morning, Verna. You found me accidentally. Uh, oh, 7 a.m. Oh, well, good morning to you. <laughs> Hi, Diana. Thank you for joining me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes getting up in the morning. I had that this morning myself. It's a little bit of a... Enjoying my pillow a little bit too much. So I'm mixing this up between my neutrals, uh, you know, sometimes I'm using more, maybe if I do it this way on my palette, you'll see when I'm going into which combination here. Not that I'm thinking about it too much, but just so that you see I'm using a variety. And so that my, my bark doesn't become too static, too dull and lifeless, it'll have warmth and cool and actually most of this is going to have something some sort of uh, dry brushing on it uh, but I'm quite deliberately leaving certain areas paints a little bit too dry I can't even get my dry brush on there so I have to remember as I'm doing this that this puddle continues to dry like so this this paint here starts off wet and then as I start painting it starts to dry up then then if I keep blotting it's going to stop working so um, or stop being dry so not dry it's going to get too dry it won't come off so the effect won't work so <clears throat> I either have to add more water to this or um, just not blot. Oops. Didn't even mean to do that. Go into my blue, burnt sienna, cobalt blue, burnt sienna, raw sienna. Now I just mixed up new paint, so I will have to make sure that I blot because the consistency in your brush is an important thing here. Um, As you will discover <laughs> as you're painting, too much just fills in, not enough doesn't give you much texture at all. 
So finding that balance really is a practice thing. And there will be one kind of final thing that I'll do on this bark to really create that that awesome uh, dimension. And uh, when this dry brushing is dried, you know, when all these layers that I'm putting on right now have dried, then I will come in and um, actually create some shadow washes in here to further emphasize the, the shadows. Sometimes my brush seems drier than other times, and that's okay, because it gives you that variation. All right, so I'm going to come in with some cools in here, and I'm not going to dry, or I'm not going to blot my brush or anything. I'm just going to come in here and Create a few shadows with blues, just the cobalt blue. So the texture, I hope you're seeing some of the texture building up here. Um, the brands of paints that I'm using, Grace, are, um, most of mine are Da Vinci watercolor. Uh, but I like I like Winsor Newton and everything else too. I have um, I kind of got started with Da Vinci because that was the paint the artist quality paint that was the best value at the local art store where I teach. Now I definitely think that you want to use good quality watercolor uh, paints, uh, but I do have to take into consideration the budgets of my students as well. So that's why I went with Da Vinci because they were really nice paint, but they're moderately priced, okay? So they're not the, the most expensive. So, um, but that's not to say that uh, it's the only paint. It, there's definitely not. There's so many other uh, wonderful um, paints out there. I have a man's face in the tree. Oh, right here. I see it. <laughs> You know what, and somebody somebody always points things like that out, and then you can't unsee it. So, uh, yeah, it does look like a man's face. I could put an eyebrow on him and everything, but I could just bro break that up. <laughs> How about that? Uh, we'll just, um, oh, that makes more, that makes it look more. <laughs> Some of this is still wet, so... All right, so I'm going to use some of the blue again. I'm just going to use this blue-gray. And I'm going to just, next to some of these darks, some of these, uh, where the where the bark is sort of lifted up and it's making a shadow underneath, um, I'm going to put a little bit of blue into some of those spots. And this is not so much a dry brush as just a um, dark shadow. But see how that, just adding that in there, uh, kind of makes that look lifted up. All right, and it also pulls into the colors in the sky here, unifying the painting, right? So it's, if I'm using the same colors throughout my painting, I will have um, 
some wonderful texture. So I should get onto my bird here because um, uh, it's already 11 o'clock. But I uh, just want to get a little bit more on here to get the overall effect. The um, paper that I'm using, the Arches paper, it's what I use most of the time. The woodpecker ate his nose, huh? Um, okay, so this salt is pretty much dry, but, um, and I, there's like bits of salt on my woodpecker and everything too, so I don't want to work on the woodpecker until I have uh, removed all the salt. But here's, here's the thing about salt, is it takes time. And if I were to take my hand and just smear right now, some of those um, little granules of salt may still have paint in them and the paint may still be wet because the salt granule is going to hold paint a lot longer than the paper. So I'm going to take my dryer and I'm just going to quickly dry this because it's done all it's going to do at this point. And I'm just going to dry this to make sure that the granules of salt have um, completely dried. Okay, so um, that didn't take long. I'm just going to take my palette knife now and gently... I'm not gouging the paper or anything like that. I'm just gently running it along the surface. Okay, so I'm going to brush off the loose salt now. Make sure there's none where I'm going to be painting on my woodpecker. Ooh, look at that nice texture. Maybe more texture than I actually needed. I, I probably, maybe, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure I would do that again. I probably would leave that a little softer. But what I could do if I wanted it softer is when I'm, and I'm not going to do it now, but um, after I'm finished painting the woodpecker, I could come in and just re-wet all of this and just let it sort of soften a little bit. Um, because anywhere where there's sort of extra paint, like where the dark rings are and that sort of thing, that will soften up and I can redistribute them and that will soften up this background a little bit more. So, uh, so that's a solution you can, you can do. Uh, if you have an uneven wash or something like that, I do that quite often. I'll advise students to do that, and it, it does make a huge difference in smoothing out the background. But this looks quite textural now. Um, it, it's still wet. I haven't quite, uh, quite dried it, but it's, it's not going to move. I think it'll be fine. Now I'm going to look at my woodpecker. Okay, so, so this little guy... If I squint my eyes really tight, what I see is I see some darks in around the face and I see a dark under the belly. And I, those are the form shadows. Okay, so we need those to create the roundness of the bird. Um, and uh, so there's even a little bit of kind of a pinky color, a taupey color right up here on the beak. Um, I'm going to have to zoom right in for you to see what I'm pointing at here. Okay, uh, so down in here, and it's picking up a little bit of the coloring from the tree. All right, so that tells me I'll put a little bit in there. A little bit of the same coloring from the tree under the chin. It's reflecting, and then a little bit of this taupey color, pinky color, right here up on the crown of the, I don't know what you call that, that little tufty part at the front, uh, but right there. So, uh, I'm going to just, I'll zoom out a little bit, but, um, but I'll get the whole bird on here and you can see what I'm going to do. So what I'll do is I'm going to 
wet this section and I want to make sure that it's not the same white of the paper. The paper itself, this is a bright white watercolor I'm using. It comes either bright white or natural white and I want to make it a little bit more like the natural white so I'm going to tint it. Um, for the most part I buy um, bright white because I know I can tint it but um, and I don't need to worry about the dark fur because or feathers because um, that's all going to uh, get covered up that'll cover up anything I do right now but um, I'm going to use some of that raw sienna because I used that before raw sienna I'm going to put a little bit on this chest area and as I as I apply this to this wet surface I'm going to be working in the same direction as the feathers would fall so if they go around the body that's the way I'm going to apply the strokes they may not even show in the end but if by chance they do happen to um, end up showing at least they'll be in the correct direction. So now I'm going to go to my cobalt blue, the grayed down version that I was using in my um, bark here. And I'm squinting my eyes here because I'm seeing that there's got to be some darks in here. And you can see some of the brush marks are actually going to show. So I'm going to come in and create that and I'm working on wet because I want to get this nice the softness uh, I mean this little woodpecker I believe was um, called downy because of its lovely soft looking fur feathers I keep saying I keep saying uh, fur when it actually is feathers but um, Okay, I'm going to take that raw sienna again and get a little bit up here on the top of the head and a little bit on the back. Okay, so just a little warmth to that color. It's very subtle, but it really does look different than the, the cools of the background, which is what I wanted. Um, the white markings on the wing, however, like look how warm this coloring is and then how white this on the um, back of the wing, the markings on the wing are so much whiter, like a cool white compared to this, which is a warm white. So I needed to come in and get that warm white in there. I missed some bark there that I'll fill that in later. Um, <clears throat> And oh, that pink, we need to get that pinky color in there. So uh, I'm going to use a little of that burnt sienna. Burnt sienna. But then I'll put, I think I've probably put a little bit of um, rose door into it. Keep that nice and soft. Not too prominent though. This woodpecker was a female. If it had been a male, there would have been a red patch near the back of the head. So this one's a lady. And um, now I'm going to come into some of my Payne's Gray because my Payne's Gray is the real dark that I used on my bark here and I'm just going to carefully because I don't want it to bleed into my uh, 
like fill in my um, markings here. So I'm going to uh, just go gently and not too much paint on my brush. I want to make sure that I get a few little feathers sticking up there so I don't want to just run a straight line across there. And this is where I can really come in and start um, ironing out some details. Now that did bleed a little bit there and that actually is going to be okay because if it bleeds just a tiny bit that will just add to that softness. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to really emphasize that by rinsing my brush, blotting it. I'm going to blot it well because I don't want it to bleed too far. I'm just going to touch that edge. And so that gets really soft right along there. <clears throat> All right. And then I'll just continue building up some of this texture here. And I'm going to go slow because I, I really want the accuracy, particularly in the bird's face, but really throughout the bird. And uh, I'm going to work around the eye here. Working around that highlight, I'm painting around things. I didn't mask things off. actually just going to paint around stuff today. I could have masked it off, but I won't. All right, so um, generally birds have um, a little bit of an eyelid, I guess you will, and uh, it's usually a little line right around the eye that you might see. Okay, so if I leave a little sliver there, You'll see what I mean. I meant to leave a little bit at the top there, but I didn't do it. Um, I will gray that down. That's really too white at the moment, but I'm going to gray it down later, and then it'll just identify where the eye is and uh, give me a nice effect there. All right, so just using the point of this little squirrel hair brush and it's giving me some pretty good detail. I do love the point on this. Look at that. It's like a needle. It's so so sharp. But um, unlike acrylic, I don't know how many of you are acrylic painters, uh, but with watercolor, if you use a brush like this, it takes a little getting used to because um, um, the uh, the paint flows out of it so much more easily than acrylic does. With acrylic, you kind of have to take your brush and press down on your paper or your canvas or whatever you're painting on. You have to press down on the bristles. But this holds so much that really you just touch the paper and you have your paint. All right, so coming in here. And I'm trying to make these edges in the direction of the feather growth. Right? So if the feathers go in one direction, I need to make sure that these sort of jagged edges are in the right direction as well. All right. I'm going to soften an edge here because I do see a little bit of softness right along here. I could come back here a little bit further too. And you know, I can fine tune this all, all I want, but I'm going to thin the paint a little bit when it comes to this beak area because um, I want it lighter on top. And Let 
just painting along here with the tip of the brush But yeah, you really have to make sure that you're not putting pressure on your paper. Even when I was doing these cracks, I was laying the brush on, on its side, but really you just need to touch the paper. You don't need to do anything to move it around. Just touch the paper, and if the paper's wet, it'll move itself. Um, The bottom part of the beak isn't going to get as much a light, so um, it's going to be quite dark. Quite a difference between the value of the upper beak and the lower beak. But the shape is very important. Oops. She says as she kind of messes it up. I'm going to blot that so it doesn't keep bleeding into the top. All right, so I'm just going to continue down, try to step it up a little bit here. And as I come down, I'm going to have to um, Keep in mind the direction, uh, like I'm going to create this, these feathers by painting up into the, um, into that, those feathers right there. So I need to come up from the edges there and work that way, sort of flicking it into it. And because I'm not going to be able to just come in with white paint and paint in those things. Even even the best gouache and everything, it's really sometimes very hard to cover it. And gouache, it doesn't always look the same. Like, it doesn't look as good as the white of the paper. So I'm painting around all these markings, which yes, I could have masked off, but I'm not doing it that way today, just... just as a matter of choice, just no particular reasoning behind it, just today I decided to paint around them. And these are very white and they look quite white compared to the, the white of the um, chest area. So I'm working around these and I'm still flicking into the into the um, downy chest area area but then you get to a point where it's actually the wing feather <clears throat> you know which is the flight wing no the flight feather <laughs> flight feather is what I meant to say <clears throat> and um, so then it becomes a straight line but I'm not there yet I need a little more, a little less water in my paint. There we go. The trick is remembering <clears throat> which areas are white and which areas are dark. So if I start in one place and just work my way down, I can 
I can pretty much stay in line if I do it that way. Uh, but sometimes if I'm drawing, what I'll do is I'll just with my pencil, I'll just pencil in these areas that I'm working on right now um, because that I can do a correction on, right? And pencil's easy to erase if I, if I mess it up, but a um, little harder with paint. Okay, so right, right along here is that's that's that straight part there. And we're getting near the end. It's picky stuff, painting around markings. We're almost there. And down here underneath, this would be the tail here that's kind of hot, hidden behind the uh, bark. But here is where you need to start flicking back into the feathers to create the look of the white ones coming over top. There we go. Okay, so I can see now that those darks are on there. And, and remember, I was talking about uh, relative value comparisons here. And uh, now that those darks are on there, boy, that, that um, raw sienna that I had put down is hardly noticeable. So I'm going to take a little bit of my, a little bit more raw sienna here and start creating a little bit of texture. Now I'm working on dry, but I'm using the raw sienna as my shadow. And if you put down color that's too strong, um, it's easy enough to just take a clean paper towel, cleanish paper towel, and just, just give it a little blot. And that pulls up a lot of that. So this is where it's really important to, to not make the strokes really long because the feathers really aren't long. Um, and I'm not making the paint di er, very strong. So it's pretty diluted color here, uh, but I can build up quite a bit with this. And you see the paint is pretty pretty runny. So just to bring, maybe I'll bring this over here just so you can see the paint that I'm using. And there's some definite directional changes here. So this is only like a shade lighter, maybe not even a, maybe a half shade lighter than what I had already done, the wash underneath. So this is very, very subtle to see. Um, I hope it's showing on the screen. Oh, thanks, Rita. Oh, thank you so much. All right, so um, underneath this wing here now, this is definitely gonna have to get a little darker in here. So I can start using a little more color. Um, and I'm looking real close at directional changes and things like that. I'm gonna come back into some of my blues and come into some of this. Because this wing is overlapping the body there so it's making a bit of shadow oh. 
Got to keep it subtle. Okay, so I'm coming in again with sort of my blue-gray, this sort of a mixture here. And I'm going to start developing what's underneath the, um, the neck here, the throat. And it's pretty dark, actually, surprisingly dark, darker than the background. So if you look at this and you see the underside, and even though you think to your head, your head says, oh, it's, it's white, white feathers, but look how dark it is compared to the background. <clears throat> so I need to go um, fairly dark here. And just just like I did down here to create the look of the white feathers coming over top, I need to come up underneath this. I'm going to switch to a little bit more warm color, burnt sienna. Um, and I need to sort of flick upward for this to create that look. I'm going to have to wait for some of that to dry to build up a little bit more texture there. But um, I'm going to come in with dampen this a little bit and just come in and add a little bit in there. Now this is pretty light here so I don't want to overdo it. I'm going to take some more of that coloring and start bringing it into the white sections. I'm going to soften edges and things like that so I'm blotting my brush and rinsing and blotting my brush and just bringing in a little bit of that warm color in there. So I'm just going to keep building up on this, coming back and revisiting some of these sections as I need to build up uh, more texture, more values, um, you know, and I'll just build this up one layer at a time, but really subtle changes each time so that I don't get this overworked. One thing I have learned to do in watercolor is be patient. Um, if you're an impatient person, this may not be the type of watercolor painting you want to do, but um, I enjoy it. I enjoy the slow build method. Um, a little bit of burnt sienna here. I'm going to come in, get a little bit more. So those feathers look like they're tucked up underneath that uh, wing a little bit more. Now I said I would come back in here to touch up a little bit more. And when it comes to the, the feathers, like when you have a... Um, an area of feathers that come towards you. It's like my fingers, okay? So if if you look at my fingers and you were to draw my hand this way right now, um, the ends of my fingers just kind of look like a circle, right? But if I lay it down this way, you know, obviously this is my fingers long, but here it looks really short. So um, the same thing happens with fur and feathers is you need to, um, when it's coming directly at you, it almost turns into a dot. And then when it starts to become a side profile where it's sort of wrapping around a form, for example, then that's when you're going to have um, more of a line instead of a dot. But that's how you create the form using feathers and, and fur and that sort of thing. So. All right, so I'm going to use a little bit of 
a little bit of Payne's Gray here just to come into some of this and get it a little bit darker. Create some more sort of layers on these feathers. Oop. Too much. All right, and you probably can't tell, and this is the crazy thing about woodpeckers, is this is actually a claw right here. I don't know if you can tell here, but that's the claw, and I know it looks like it's like coming out of his chest, but the leg is actually bent up, and that's the way they are. They're a little bit of an acrobat, these birds. <coughs> so they will, um, they will, take surprising forms. I'm coming in with a little bit more of the um, Payne's Gray in here just to darken this a bit more. But um, now I'm going to come up to this where this toe is. And that's all you see basically is a bit of the nail and the toe. The toe's a little pink so I'm going to go into the coloring I used up here. There we go. And as for the rest of, um, there's one more up here. I know it seems crazy high, but that's our, uh, that's our woodpecker. And I've just got a couple more bits of the bark to put in here, so I'm just going to add that in. Um, all right, so I think that that's close enough to being done here. I think I can add a little bit more, but um, that's close enough to being done for today. And um, if I wanted to smooth out this background, I'm just going to take a big brush here and re-wet. There may have been a little bit of color in that brush, but I'm just going to carefully, and I have to work really carefully around this Payne's Gray now. I don't want it bleeding into my background. But see how the salt is starting to just soften up, and I can soften up this background. Be really careful around the, the bird and everything. But if I wanted some of that texture gone so that it's not too competing with the bark and that sort of thing. I can just sort of move the paint that's already there. The thing about salt is you can't always predict exactly how much texture it's going to end up being. Um, well, with experience you can. If you use it a lot, that sort of thing. But um, I can I can actually take this. Let me move it down maybe. You can see here. So there was quite a bit of texture up in there, and you can see that I'm actually pulling it, a, pulling a lot of it off. And I'm just going to blot this, and everything will be nice and soft, and there won't be as much texture there. So less competing with the um, with the background. There we go. So I could work at this a little longer, make it lighter if I want to, that sort of thing, but uh, that's the gist of it anyway. If you wanted to smooth out a background, if you have, uh, you know, if you've painted in a background and you have a blotchy area, that's a good way to sort of smooth things out. So I'll zoom out. And I thank you for joining me today. And uh, next Wednesday, I guess we'll see you at the same place, same channel. Thanks a million, everybody, and uh, have a great week. Bye for now.